10 billion dollars. I mean, just speak about the magnitude of that. That is by far the biggest uh, commitment of the foundation, isn't it, Bill? I mean, this is this is by far the largest. That's right. We've been spending a lot on vaccines. Uh, with this commitment, uh, over 8 million additional lives will be saved. So it's one of the most effective ways that uh, health in the poorest countries can be dramatically improved. In January of 2010, Bill and Melinda Gates used the World Economic Forum at Davos to announce a staggering $10 billion commitment to research and develop vaccines for the world's poorest countries, kicking off what he called a decade of vaccines. Today we're announcing a commitment over this next decade, uh, which we think of as a, a decade of uh, vaccines having incredible impact. Uh, we're announcing that uh, we'll spend over $10 billion on vaccines. Hailed by the Gates-funded media. For the record, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a news hour underwriter. And applauded by the pharmaceutical companies who stood to reap the benefits of that largesse. The record-setting commitment made waves in the international community, helping to underwrite a global vaccine action plan coordinated by the Gates-funded World Health Organization. But contrary to the Gates' own PR spin that this $10 billion pledge was an unalloyed good and would save 8 million lives, the truth is that this attempt to reorient the global health economy was part of a much bigger agenda. An agenda that would ultimately lead to greater profits for big pharma companies, greater control for the Gates Foundation over the field of global health, and greater power for Bill Gates to shape the course of the future for billions of people around the planet. This is Bill Gates' plan to vaccinate the world. You're tuned into The Corbett Report. Given Gates' pledge to make this a decade of vaccines, it should come as no surprise that, since the dawn of this coronavirus crisis, he has been adamant that the world will not go back to normal until a vaccine has been developed. But we're going to have this intermediate period of opening up, uh, and it won't be normal until we get a, an amazing vaccine uh, to the entire world. The vaccine is, is critical because until you have that, things aren't really going to be normal. They can open up to some degree, but the risk of a rebound will be there until we have very broad vaccination. Well, they won't be back to normal until we either have that phenomenal vaccine or a therapeutic that's like over 95% effective. And so we have to assume that's going to be almost 18 months from now. And then the final solution, uh, which is a year to two years off, is the vaccine. So we've got to mm -hmm. go full speed ahead on all three fronts. Uh, just to head off the conspiracy theorists, maybe we shouldn't call the vaccine the final solution. Maybe just the Good best point. solution. <laughs> okay. More interestingly, since Gates began delivering this same talking point in every one of his many media appearances of late, it has been picked up and repeated by heads of state, health officials, doctors, and media talking heads, right down to the scientifically arbitrary but very specific 18-month time frame. Realistically, COVID-19 will be here for the next 18 months or more. We will not be able to return to normalcy until we find a vaccine or effective medications. The hard fact is, until we find a vaccine, going back to normal means putting lives at risk. This will be the new normal until a vaccine is developed. The only thing that will really allow life as we once knew it to resume is a vaccine. Obviously, we continue to work on the vaccines, but the vaccines have to be down the road by probably 14, 15, 16 months. We're doing great on the vaccines. The fact that so many heads of state, health ministers, and media commentators are dutifully echoing Gates's pronouncements about the need for a vaccine will not be surprising to those who saw last week's exploration of how Bill Gates monopolized global health. As we have seen, the Gates Foundation's tentacles have penetrated into every corner of the field of public health. Billions of dollars in funding and entire public policy agendas are under the control of this man, an unelected, unaccountable software developer with no medical research experience or training. And nowhere is Gates's control of public health more apparent than in the realm of vaccines. Gates launched the decade of vaccines with a $10 billion pledge. 
Gates helped develop the Global Vaccine Action Plan administered by the Gates-funded World Health Organization. Gates helped found Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, aiming to develop healthy markets for vaccine manufacturers. Gates helped launch Gavi with a $1 billion donation in 2011, going on to contribute $4.1 billion over the course of the decade of vaccines. And so I'm pleased to announce to you that we're pledging an additional billion dollars uh, to... Thank you. All right, thank you. It's not every day we give away a billion uh, dollars. One of the Gates Foundation's core funding areas is vaccine development and surveillance, which has resulted in the channeling of billions of dollars into vaccine development, a seat at the table to develop vaccination campaigns in countries around the globe, and the opportunity to shape public thinking about Bill Gates' pet project of the past five years, preparing rapid development and deployment of vaccines in the event of a globally spreading pandemic. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus. Whether it occurs by the quirk of nature at the hand of a terrorist, epidemiologists show through their models that a respiratory spread pathogen would kill more than 30 million people in less than a year. And there is a reasonable probability of that taking place in the years ahead. Many high-profile personalities have been gathering at this year's World Economic Forum in Davos, which aims to discuss and deal with the globe's most pressing issues. Amongst them is the Microsoft founder Bill Gates. His foundation is investing millions in the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations to help combat infectious diseases. Here's some of what he had to say about his push to develop new vaccines. Unfortunately, it takes many years to do a completely new vaccine. The design, the, the safety reviews, Costs. the manufacturing, all those things uh, mean that uh, an epidemic can be very widespread before that tool would come along. And so after Ebola, the global health community talked a lot about this, uh, including an, a new type of uh, vaccine platform called DNA RNA mm. that should speed things along. And so uh, this Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, CEPI, CEPI, uh, is uh, three countries, Japan, Norway, Germany, and two foundations. Uh, Welcome Trust, uh, who we work with on a lot of things, and our foundation, Gates Foundation, uh, coming together to fund, uh, uh, actually trying to use that platform and make uh, some vaccines, and so that would help us in the future. We know vaccines can protect us. We just need to be better prepared. So let's come together. Let's research. And invest. Let's save lives. Let's, Let's outsmart, outsmart epidemics. epidemics. Given Gates's mammoth investment in vaccines over the past decade, his insistence that things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. Is hardly surprising. What should be surprising is that this strangely specific and continuously repeated message, that we will not go back to normal until we get a vaccine in 18 months, has no scientific basis whatsoever. Medical researchers have already conceded that a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 may not even be possible, pointing to the inability of researchers to develop any kind of immunization against previous coronavirus outbreaks like SARS or MERS. But even if such a vaccine were possible, serious concerns remain about the safety of developing, testing, and delivering such an amazing vaccine to the entire world in this remarkably short time frame. 
even proponents of vaccine development openly worry that the rush to vaccinate billions of people with a largely untested experimental coronavirus vaccine will itself present grave risks to the public. One of these risks involves disease enhancement. It has been known for over a decade that vaccination for some viral infections, including coronaviruses, actually enhances susceptibility to viral infection or even causes infections in healthy vaccine recipients. Now, the issue of safety, something that I want to make sure the American public understand. It's not only safety when you inject somebody and they get maybe an idiosyncratic reaction, they get a little allergic reaction, they get pain. There's safety associated. Does the vaccine make you worse? And there are diseases in which you vaccinate someone, they get infected with what you're trying to protect them with, and you actually enhance the infection. This is no mere theoretical risk. As researchers who were trying to develop a vaccine for the original SARS outbreak discovered, the vaccine actually made the lab animals subjected to it more susceptible to the disease. One of the things that we're not hearing a lot about is the unique potential safety problem of coronavirus vaccines. Uh, this was uh, first found in the early 1960s with the respiratory syncytial virus uh, vaccines, at children, and it was done here in Washington with the NIH and Children's National Medical Center, that some of those kids who got the vaccine actually did worse and I believe there were two deaths as in, in the consequence of that study. Because what happens with certain types of respiratory virus vaccines, you get immunized, and then when you get actually exposed to the virus, you get this kind of paradoxical immune enhancement phenomenon. And, what ha and, and we, we don't entirely understand the basis of it, but we recognize that it's a real problem for certain respiratory virus vaccines. That killed the RSV program for decades. Now the Gates Foundation is taking it up again. But when we started developing uh, coronavirus vaccines and our colleagues, we noticed in laboratory animals that they started to show some of the same immune pathology that resembled what had happened 50 years earlier. This specific issue regarding coronavirus vaccines is exacerbated by the arbitrary and unscientific 18-month time frame that Gates is insisting on for the vaccine's development. In order to meet that deadline, vaccine developers are being urged to use new and largely unproven methods for creating their experimental immunizations, including DNA and mRNA vaccines. For a self-described wartime president, victory over COVID-19 equals a vaccine. I hope we're going to have a vaccine and, and we're going to fast track it like you've never seen before. Adding Trump style branding, the administration launched Operation Warp Speed, a multi-billion dollar research and manufacturing effort to shorten the typical year plus vaccine development timeline. We're going to start ramping up production with the companies involved. And you do that at risk. In other words, you don't wait until you get an answer before you start manufacturing. You at risk proactively start making it, assuming it's going to work. You're thinking 18 months, even with all the work that you've already done to this point and the planning that you are taking with lots of different potential uh, vaccinations and building up for that now? Yeah, so the, there's an approach called the RNA vaccine that people like Moderna, CureVac, uh, and others are using that in 2015, we'd identified that as very promising uh, for pandemics and for uh, other applications as well. And so if everything goes perfectly uh, with the RNA approach, we could actually beat the 18 months. We don't want to create unrealistic expectations. So the concept of an RNA vaccine is Let's inject the RNA molecule that encodes for the spike protein. It's making your cell do the work of creating this viral protein that is going to be recognized by your immune system and trigger um, the development of these antibodies. Our bodies won't make a full-fledged infectious virus, they'll just make a little piece and then learn to recognize it and then get ready to destroy the virus if it then later comes and invades us. It's a relatively new, unproven technology. And there's still no example of an RNA vaccine that's been deployed worldwide in the way that we need for the coronavirus. There's the possibility for unforeseen adverse effects. So this is all new territory, whether it would elicit protective immune response against this virus is just unknown right now.